Hi everyone, um, my name is Itoria. I'm a member of Art for the People. And today I have the pleasure of being with... Hi everyone, my name is Ethel. I'm also with Art for the People. Uh, we are both on the Political Education Propaganda Committee. Uh, we're very excited to be here today. We are going to be talking about and assessing the class character of Macklemore's most recent song, Hins Hall. Uh, definitely really interesting uh, and very excited to be talking it, uh, about it today with, yeah. with my friend, good friend and comrade V. Yeah, no, and we just want to clarify and emphasize, you know, before we get into the song, that um, it's a great song overall. I love the song. As soon as it came out, I reposted it on my socials and you know, Macklemore clearly has very good intentions, and he's one of the few big artists right now that's willing to make art in support of Palestine publicly, boldly, and shamelessly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so um, without further ado, let's get straight into it. Q. All right, awesome. For the record, we could not hear the song. <laughs> so, um, real quick, as just a general disclaimer, uh, I want to say, you know, it's very prevalent inside of capitalist society, bourgeois society, that criticism of any particular thing is usually associated with immediate, like, dislike or hatred of said thing. You know, you, like, there's a general cultural element in bourgeois society where it's like, if you're criticizing something, that thing is bad, it shouldn't be paid attention to. Mm -hmm. This is not the case here. This is a hallmark and a cultural touchstone for artists uh, and art uh, being made in political solidarity with Palestine and with the Palestinian people. However, that does not mean to say that this is the be all end all for art in relation to this movement we need to really assess the good and bad qualities of anything we produce uh, in order to make better things in the future. And that is tenfold with art. We need to really be capable of assessing the quality of art uh, and its class character in order to keep moving in the direction that we need to move for the future for a revolution. Yeah, no, and important like to add to what Ethel just said, you know, we live under capitalism, right, which is a class society. And in this class society, right, the capitalist class does a really good, a solid, excellent job of um, putting out uh, capitalist class or bourgeoisie, bourgeois propaganda that, you know, encourages artists to stay away, to, it discourages artists to talk about socialism, revolution. So um, as I mentioned before, Macklemore has the best of intentions with this song, and he does, there are some good points of the song that we will acknowledge um, when the time comes. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, there, we're not saying like, oh, Macklemore should have discussed these things, because it, there's a reason why a lot of artists don't touch on these things. We're just saying like, he's on the right path. Here are just, you know, some points of clarity that um, Ethel and I are gonna highlight today. So yeah, so, you know, with this song, uh, he just, uh, we just played the first portion, right? Yes. So he ended it with, uh, you know, the system is designed by white supremacy. So like a big part of um, a very popular trend right now, right? And like left-leaning online spaces, uh, this goes towards anti-capitalist spaces and even spaces uh, that identify as a socialist, communist, revolutionary. A very popular trend is to get caught up in the concept, um, the liberal concept of identity politics. And what is identity politics? I'll let Ethel dive into that. Uh, identity politics um, is something that's been prevalent amongst like, I'll call them left circles uh, for 
probably got about the past 50 years. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, like, you know, it's been more prevalent. But the particular aspect of identity politics that's important is that it places identity as the primary contradiction of a thing or the primary aspect of a contradiction in a thing. Uh, whereas, you know, we live in class society. The primary as uh, the the primary aspect of the principal contradiction, yeah. sorry, uh, here is class, is class. What identity politics does is it swaps that with identity, with a person's identity, and makes that the principal thing here. So the problem there is you start really looking for these single-minded binaries in a dogmatic fashion where you're not looking at all sides of a thing, you're really only focusing on one um, and saying that this is the the be-all, end-all for the problems in our society. Exactly. When it, it goes deeper than that. Uh, the, this, the reason why this is a, a liberal uh, quality in politics uh, and not a revolutionary quality is because you cannot have a proletarian revolution if your sole focus is on identity. In order to have a proletarian revolution, you need to be focused on class. That is one of the most important things that I want to hammer down here. And this event, you know, the genocide in Palestine, is completely dependent on class society, is completely dependent on, like, American imperialism. Uh, so I, I, I really want to hammer down, like, the importance of that and the importance of class when it comes to our analysis and our production uh, of art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, you know, Ethel and I are getting a lot into, like, the technicality of class society versus white supremacy, so I do want to provide a sort of disclaimer before I continue. Um, this may seem like we're getting too wound up in textbook definitions, but, you know, if, you know, as I mentioned, Art for the People is an anti-capitalist artist collective here in South Florida. Ethel and I are members of this. If we want to see the downfall of capital, we need to understand how to go about that, right? Like, okay, well, how do we, right? Well, how, do, how does the downfall of capital happen? We need a proletarian, meaning a working class socialist revolution. How do we, you know, how do we reach that point of revolution? We need to understand strategy, but we can't understand strategy. We can't, you know, organize um, with a clear direction, a concise plan if we don't understand, you know, the structures at play. So when Macklemore says, you know, um, the system was designed by white supremacy, he's giving the, the impression that race is the issue, right? So when we say that race is the primary issue and not class society, as Ethel previously mentioned, it, people will start saying, oh, okay, well, you know, if race is the issue, if white supremacy is, is the primary contradiction here, then the, then the clear solution is to, uh, you know, focus on anti-racist education, organize around race. But we, we all know that, you know, with the capitalist class, and those are the people that own, you know, uh, the, the factories, the, company, the big companies, the banks, these are not all owned by exclusively white people, right? There are non-white capitalists. So it's, you know, when we talk about white supremacy, and as we mentioned, this is not Macklemore's intention to, like, stray us away from revolution. It's a very, it is, like, I would say the dominant trend uh, online right now in, in, like, leftist spaces. When we say, oh, yeah, this system was designed by white supremacy, we are unintentionally gearing people away from, you know, organizing and uh, studying class society. Exactly. Uh, one thing I also want to hammer down is... The fact that, like, all of this is to be said, uh, it, like, white supremacy, we're not saying that it doesn't exist. You know what I mean? We're not saying that this isn't a massive problem in society. Uh, white supremacy characterizes a lot of particularly American life, you know? The question is, how does that come to be, you know? How do we get to this stage in history? So the only way to materially figure that out so that way we can move forward to try to solve this problem is figuring out where does white supremacy come from, where in history can we pinpoint that, how did these develop, and then how does that continue to exist today. The only way you can really materially solve a problem is by having a full concrete understanding of that problem, a materialist understanding of that problem, and that gives you the tools to move forward. 
This is a part of the reason why historical materialism is so important, you know? What uh, is, ooh, you dropped a word there. What is historical materialism? Oh, historical materialism is, you know, it's the process of, of, of applying, and I'm going to drop another vocab word here, uh, dialectical materialism to history, you know? It's the process of seeing all of history through a, through a dialectical lens, you know? Uh, and dialectics is, and I'm going to be reductive here for the sake of time because I could talk for hours about dialectics. No, 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 go. You don't have to be reductive. Go, no, go into it. Well, <laughs> we only have an hour here. I don't want to waste time. Um, dialectics is basically seeing things uh, in contradiction with other things and seeing the process of thing, uh, uh, processes of how things move and evolve through the motion of those contradictions, you know? Um, let's say, like... I slide a rock across this table, there are, you know, forces in that motion. The forces would be, you know, momentum and inertia. When the rock is moving faster, uh, it is gaining momentum. Momentum is the principal force in the contradiction between momentum and inertia. Once it reaches a, a principal point, once those antagonistic contradictions, you know, reach their point of rupture, then inertia takes hold uh, as the primary force inside of this contradiction, and that object begins to slow down. You know, uh, like I said, this is a super re reductive example here, and I'm doing that for the sake of time. Um, we can see that process of change in things, how matter moves, and apply that to the process of history. How does, you know, capitalist, uh, how does, you know, uh, wealth accumulation happen through history, you know? How does that inform patriarchy? How does that inform white supremacy, you know? How did we get to where we are now? The only way we can figure this out is by looking to history and analyzing how does history move. Once we figure that out, then we have a proper framework to interpret history moving forward. Definitely. And um, Ethel and I are using the word contradiction a lot. And I do want to provide just a little clarity. And I'll, I'll summarize it to, you know, to be conscious of time. But um, there is a, a writing called On Contradiction. It's actually part of, like I would say, a, a set that complements each other well, On Practice and On Contradiction by Mao. And the simplest example, the most like relevant example I can think of with contradiction is, you know, we live in capitalism, capitalist society, right? You have two classes in class society. You have the bourgeoisie, otherwise known as the capitalist class. These are the people, as I've mentioned before, they own everything, right? They own the factories, the companies, the banks. And then you have the proletariat, which is known as the working class. And I would say the most defining characteristic of the working class is that all we have to sell is our labor power. That's all we have to sell, right? We don't own anything. We don't own like a bunch of real estate. You know, we all we can sell is is our time and our labor. Vittoria, could you do me a favor, actually, and just go ahead and define labor power real quick? Because it is materially different from labor itself. So yes, no, that's actually a really good point. Um, so labor power, I would say, is the ability to perform labor. And then could you provide the definition of labor? Uh, labor is labor isn't just any given action that has the potential to change things. You know, um, when I like clean my dishes, I'm performing labor by materially changing my dishes. Mm -hmm. You know, when I like uh, those are good examples. When I go to work, I'm materially changing things by like you know organizing things to be shipped out. You know, if, if I'm working in a distribution center in, uh, of some kind, you know. Uh, labor is the process of m changing the material world by using our bodies. Definitely. And labor power is like the ability for us to sell our labor. So I would say that's um, like the main mm -hmm. difference. I, 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 I would categorize, categorize it more as like a person's capacity to perform labor. That's good. Uh, like labor power is an abstract value form insofar as it, it is a unit of measurement of a, of a human's ability to perform labor, you know? No. Like, like a gram is a unit of measurement of weight. So, like, I, I don't wanna, 
be overly scientific no, no, because we I should can, be. No, yeah, we should be technical. So I, I'm glad you're I, we should be technical, but I don't want to be mechanical in my analysis. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, continue. I'm so sorry. No, I no, cut no. You off. That, was, that was an important point. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up. And so, you know, when we look at the the primary contradiction, right? Like the most the most uh, prevalent contradiction in capitalism in class society is uh, these two classes, right? Because they have what we consider antagonistic class interests, right? It is not in our class interests to be exploited, right? Like all of our labor is, you know, we don't see the benefits of that. The ca or we, I should say we don't see all or even uh, the majority of the benefits. The majority of the, of the fruits of our labor are that we reap uh, goes into the capitalist class. It's, it's extracted by the capitalist, exactly. you know? Um, through, uh, and, and that extracted labor power is called uh, surplus, surplus value. value. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. yeah, so I just wanted to provide a, a little bit of clarification because I know we're talking about contradiction a lot in these things. You know, we brought up uh, historical materialism, dialectical materialism, and yeah, so with that, with those uh, disclaimers, yeah, I, I think we pretty much hit it. So. When we say the system is designed by white supremacy, we are, we're not being completely, we're not being accurate, right? This system was designed, if, if Malcolm Moore had said, and instead of saying, and this system was designed by white supremacy, if he instead said, and this system was designed by class society, which in turn breeds um, white supremacy, misogyny, homophobia, Transphobia. Patriarchy. Patriarchy. Patriarchy generally. Happy Pride Month, by the way. Happy Pride Month, everybody. <laughs> Homophobia. <laughs> 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 but um, um, yeah, so it's just, and it's, it may come off as little things, but no, this, this is so important. That song has over 3 million likes on Instagram right now, and that, that's just one platform, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was shared by... Um, the most like well-known journalist in Palestine. So it's a song that's being globally celebrated right now. And we do have to take very seriously how the art that we consume affects our world look. I also, I want to give the song a lot of credit. You know, the song, it, it comes in at a time when like most mainstream artists are not saying anything about this. And to some level that is to be expected, right? You know, you have to ask yourself like, this is their bread and butter, you know? They're not gonna like jeopardize that uh, by making political claims. Most, most popular artists won't do that right now. Well, you know? class society. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They have a vested it's, interest in, in maintaining class society because they benefit from it, you know? It's uh, not in their class interest mm -hmm. to, to make music. Exactly, class. exactly. So, Macklemore, when he's doing this, you know, he is like making a strike against uh, the imperialist system. Uh, our critiques come in in saying that strike could be better targeted if his knowledge of the imperialist system uh, was more scientific. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that's where our analysis comes in. Uh, it, it, this is like why it's so important to be scientific because then, like, you have a real materially accurate. Uh, you know, uh, understanding of how these systems came to be and how we can actually make strikes against these systems, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we need to concretely understand who our real friends and real enemies are. And at front, that can seem like an obvious, you know, answer. Like, oh, you know, our enemies are the imperialists. Okay, but like, name them. You know, that's more difficult than, it's, than just speaking generally. We have to really understand not just the generals, but the particulars. And, you know, these go about informing each other. So it, this is why it's so important to be scientific in our understanding of the imperialist system. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I would say, I don't even think people have, in general, right, the average person, and this, like, I don't mean to say this in, like, a... In a way to look down upon people again this is just how the cap the capitalist class socially conditions us and like the propaganda we're fed i don't think the average person like i certainly wouldn't have reached this point like a year ago would even say oh it's the imperialist fault mm -hmm. i would they they understand they would say biden uh macklemore does give uh, yeah biden. macklemore ca calls out biden uh which is like you know a really a great call out um 
but at the same time, like, this is not just Biden, you know? Like, we, we know that, like, no matter who gets into office uh, after the next election cycle, that this, it will not stop the genocide. Uh, every candidate going up for a seat, uh, a, you know, of, like, the core of imperialist power it will benefit from maintaining the genocide in Palestine. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that. that. There is no electoral way for us to claw, claw our way out of this problem, mm -hmm. you know? No, definitely. Also worth noting, the United States is not the only imperialist power. Oh, of yeah. course, right? Yeah. You know, uh, we maintain that uh, nations like China, uh, Russia, Russia, you know, the NATO no countries, uh, Japan, uh, uh, France, uh, I could go on. Britain, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. Like, I, this is a very long list, you know? Uh, we maintain that these nations are imperialist nations, uh, that they um, fundamentally act in a ma manner where they send out, you know, finance capital all over the world uh, so that way they can reap uh, their imperialist super profits, you yeah. know? Look at production in India, look at in production in nations like Bangladesh, you know? Um, you know, Central Africa with the Congo, uh, say, like, the, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. We will get more, because I want to hit the, the next line, but mm -hmm. we're definitely going to get more into that. I'm okay. glad you brought that up. Um, and uh, there was, hold on, there was one more thing, but it's fine. Let's cue the, the second portion of the song, and I'll, I'll signal you. All right. All right. So, yeah, no. So at this part of the song, right, um, Macklemore says at the, like, the very um, last statement, the Nakba never ended, the colonizer lied. Um, so again, so you can see that from this song, we still have a little bit to go. But in general, the two big takeaways are that uh, white supremacy and colonization are the two main factors, the two, you know, things to blame in this. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, again, this is, and this ties into another dominant trend in uh, left-leaning online spaces where there's a lot of focus on colonization versus capitalism. And as we mentioned, the intentions are good, but this strays us, this takes us away from talking about revolution and socialism and it, communism. It kind of... It's putting the cart before, before the horse in your analysis. You know what I mean? If you're focusing on colonization, you're focusing on white supremacy, like, you are seeing those things as, like, you know, the primary here. Uh, and essentially, like, reaching, oh, you know, capitalism is something that comes from these things, you know? When really it's the other way around, you know? Exactly. Uh, class society leads to cl uh, capitalism and colonization, white supremacy, um, and, you know, I keep harp harping on patriarchy, but it's true. Uh, like, these are all symptoms of class society, you know, not the other way around. Uh, and it's very, very important. It, like, I cannot stress the importance of it enough uh, that we see, like, the, the true root cause of this issue being the development of class society. Because, you know, we maintain the line that it is... Um, forgive me to get a bit poetic here, the sacred role of the proletariat, <laughs> uh, of the working class, to end class society. Now, the only way we can do that is by scientific analysis of class society yeah. and through the social practice of class struggle, you know? Mm -hmm. um, 
and one more thing. I'm gonna no, no, please keep go, going. Go, go, go. Um, that is not to say that like we reach socialism and the class struggle is magically ended. You know, we've did it. we've done it. It's over. Uh, we did it, Joe. Yeah, we did. We did it, Joe. <laughs> class society has ended. Um, like that's that's just not how it works. You know, we have to be honest with ourselves and we have to really understand that the bourgeoisie, the capitalists. They are smart enough uh, and uh, strategic enough to realize, you know, that they still have an opportunity to reinsert themselves, reassert themselves uh, in a post-revolutionary, in a socialist uh, society. Yeah. Um, and the question then becomes, how do you maintain the class struggle in a socialist society? But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get back to no, the point. No, yeah, no, you're, those were good points. Thank and you. You know, you'll see in a lot of posts online an emphasis on Israel being the colonizer. And that's why phrasing is so important here, because if we just say, I even saw a post once that said the colonizer class. Colonizers are not a class, right? As we mentioned earlier, capitalism is class society in which there are two basic classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Um, so this is what happens, right, when we don't have, like, a clear, you know, um, interpretation, comprehension of the dynamic here. And so when we say Israel is the colonizer, we need to stop Israel. And, they're, you know, I'll, to their credit, I will say they do make, um, they do acknowledge that, you know, Israel and the United States are tied. It's, it's very, you know, they're allies. Uh, Israel Even Macklemore points it out through APAC and, you know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, yeah, Israel exists... Um, because it's a strategic ally for the U.S. and the Middle East. That, uh, that has been pointed out by these posts. But the problem is, you know, they're jumping back on, you know, like white supremacy. It's when we emphasize that, then the point becomes, well, the, Palesti the genocide in Palestine is because they're brown and indigenous. Mm -hmm. And instead of, you know, doing a class analysis and understanding, like, under Palestine, there's, uh, I believe, $500 billion worth of oil. Yeah, $500 billion worth of oil. I think, God, don't quote me on this. Uh, rough estimation. Rough estimation is around 1.5 billion barrels of oil. Oil alone, not including natural gas, in Gaza, and 1.7 billion in the West Bank. So there is a lot of material incentive for, you know, carrying out this genocide, you know? Now the question becomes, how do you ideologically justify this genocide to the people living inside your nation? And that's where, you know, this, this white supremacist angle comes in of, like, and it, it's classic, right? You know, you, you, if you've seen any form of colonization in your life, it's always the same justification. Oh, these people are subhuman. Savages. You know, savages, you know, they need to be civilized, blah, blah, blah. And, like, the more you strip it down, the more it's just, like, you know, mm -hmm. blatant, like, vitriol uh, towards another human, uh, not only because of the color of their skin or where the land that they hail from, but because of the resources that that land is on top of. Mm-hmm. And, you know, speaking on the importance of phrasing, we need to also address, like, the, the consequences of this, right? Because whenever it's brought up, you know, online spaces, not just online, in, in public forums, in real life, if you dare address that in Israel there is a proletariat, the Israeli proletariat exists, there is a strong backlash um, because, like, how dare you? You know, these Israelis are, are racist. They're settlers. They're all settlers. They all deserve to burn and die. I'm being a bit exaggerative. Not, not every person that... Well, I, 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 I would agree with that. Like, dude, yeah. some, some of the, the talking points that have come out are just, like, blatant overgeneralizations, you know? We, we, we know that there are protests going on in Israel. We know that there is a strong uh, con constituent of, you know... Um, Anti-Netanyahu. Yeah. Uh, like, and even then, you know, those are, like, Netanyahu is fairly far right, even for, like, you know, the Israeli sa status quo. Um, and there are some, like, political protests just on the basis of Netanyahu. But there are also some that are on the basis of, like, blat like flat out ending the genocide in Palestine, you know? Mm -hmm. There are Israeli citizens that do not want this to continue that are separate from the settlers, you know? And we have to be capable of making that distinction because, like, 
there are forces that we may not like, uh, but we still have to ally with to over overthrow our true enemy. Strategically and, and sometimes temporarily. Exactly, you know. Strategic and temporary unity on a single issue is so important because if you can't do that, then you wouldn't be able to get anything done. This was a question of like, you know, the national war in China against the Japanese imperialists where, you know, the Kuomintang and the Chinese Communist Party, they had to ally together in order to like defeat the, def Japanese, defeat imperialists. the Japanese imperialists. And if they hadn't have done that, then they would have lost their nation and become a colony of Japan. So, uh, like, this is a, a massive, massive problem that comes through in sort of these, like, idealist, you know, um, statements that are coming out around Israel and Palestine. That's why being scientific is so important. Having an accurate analysis of who your friends and who your enemies are is so important because then you know who to strike against. Mm -hmm. You know, Ethel brought up earlier dialectical materialism. With me and Ethel saying this, are we denying that there is a, a general and a, I would say potent culture in Israel of hatred towards Palestinians? No, of course. Like, yes, I would, I would say there is a culture that exists in Israel that believes Palestinians are subhumans and they deserve everything that's coming to them. And again, that is the effectiveness of bourgeois propaganda, right? Because they're being fed this, they're taking it in, and they're, they're you know, spewing it back out. Um, so we can acknowledge that there is an Israeli proletariat or an Israeli working class, while also acknowledging, like, yes, they, they do, there is, you know, they're socially conditioned to feel entitled to this land and say this is our land, not your land. So it's important to understand that both things can exist. You know, like how we spoke earlier, like we can criticize this song and we can still appreciate and value this song for, you know, how, how strong it is, especially, you know, in today's culture. So, yeah. So um, something else I want to point out yeah. here is like, I want to really highlight like this, this failure of analysis, right? Is not like the particular fault of any given individual, you know? If you see someone like posting online uh, and they're posting things that like aren't necessarily scientific, you know, uh, I, I, I do not blame those people like for posting those things That's or saying point. those things, you know? This is a, a, a general failure of, you know, the Western left, let's call it, for the past, God, 50, 60 years, you know? We have not had like a genuine scientific focused um, uh, proletarian movement in this, in this country uh, for over 50 years at this point. Yeah. And the analysis that has come out of this country is, that is like attempting to be anti-imperialist, that is attempting to be anti-capitalist, that is attempting to be revolutionary, is struggling because of that. If you don't have like a history to draw from, it's exceptionally hard to start from nothing, yeah. you know? And we are, the, these things that people are saying and posting and doing, we are witnessing the internal struggle play out, mm -hmm. you know? This is something that takes time. This is not something that happens overnight. It's a learning process. So. Yeah. No, I really appreciate Ethel bringing that up because uh, uh, to be clear, like I used to get all of my uh, like political information, political education, I should say, from social media up until about a year and a half ago. So the only reason that Ethel and I are able to provide this analysis to you is because we've, we've joined Marxist study groups um, and yeah, and we've, you know, tried our best to be disciplined in studying a revolutionary political theory and revolutionary history. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It, it takes a lot of seriously concentrated study to get to the root of this. You and know? to be important, study groups, right? Because uh, prior to joining like a, a collective or a community that wants to study this together, I tried to tackle this on my own. I was, and I know that there, there definitely is, especially right now, like a curiosity and a hunger for this stuff, right? People want answers. They're just not sure where to go. Um, so prior to being invited to Art for the People, I was trying to read Marx on my own. But, you know, the text can be a bit intimidating and it's not, you know, if you don't have people to discuss it with, you know, in Marxist circles, there's a concept called struggle, which in a way I would say is like, I would say it's similar to debate, where it's like you help each other, you know, um, 
combat capitalist propaganda and like you help each other grasp these working class ideas. I, I would I would like to characterize sh struggle and debate as like separate things. Mm -hmm. While they do have similar qualities, yeah. Um, you know, struggle is really the attempt to find a concrete and scientific line to follow. You know? Political unity. Po like with, with political unity being the core of like what you are trying to get at here. The goal is to main maintain unity. Uh, if you're struggling on a particular issue, what you want is understanding. Whereas like a debate is regularly, you know, two people coming up uh, at, an, uh, at a topic from opposing sides and really have no intention of changing their views, you know? Uh, the, goal, the goal of struggle is to be scientific, uh, and I see the goal of debate as just sort of like generally, you know, for like the fun of the game, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it's a sport. It, it's, it's a sport. It's a sparring event. That's, a, yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, and I, like, I think that's important to get across. So Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So yeah. So uh, now we're going to go into the last portion of the song. So yeah, at this point, we can let the song play out until the end. Yeah. All right. Um, so, you know, generally, uh, we 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 see Macklemore's point as like just coming back to colonialism here. Yes. And while, and I, I've talked about this before. You know, uh, colonialism is a a symptom of class society is not the root. But it is necessary to, to understand colonialism property, properly in order to move forward. It's funny that I uh, slipped on property there because <laughs> this is fundamentally about property accumula uh, accumulation, you know? Um, we, the question here is how does wealth become accumulated over time, you know? If we're asking how did we get here so that way we can understand where to go, we have to ask, okay, how did wealth become concentrated in such few hands? Uh, and that fundamentally brings us, like, you know, primitive accumulation. How, what's that? How did it happen? Um, we know that wealth, wealth in society is uh, the immense uh, uh, accumulation of commodities. Um, and like, we know that class society has not always existed. Uh, the, the, the first formation, the first societal formation was what's called the primitive commune. Uh, the primitive commune was the longest form of societal development. Um, it was also communist, by the way. Commune, it, primitive. It, 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 was a, it, was it was primitive communist. You it, know? Was it was a, a classless It was society. classless, stateless, moneyless society. But there were still like warring tribes, you know, they're generally like tribalist mindsets, mm. but people lived in community with one another inside of any given tribe. So there's a lot of good elements and some bad elements that needed to be, um, you know, developed out of. And what eventually happens is, you know, 
we start getting like wealth accumulation through the advent of agriculture. Um, then we start like getting into, uh, you know, the pairing marriages uh, it, from the transition of agriculture to barbarous society, where you start seeing like more and more of monogamous type relationships. So that way you can guarantee, you know, uh, which child is w related to which parent. Uh, that's when we see like sort of the advent of patriarchy come about, uh, where you know we have these uh, monogamistic uh, monogamistic relationships. So that way, you know, the father can understand like who is my son. So that way, I can pass my wealth to my son. So that way, my son can continue to accumulate wealth, and that goes down the chain. And that keeps going, so you have this new class uh, developing that's wealthy, and they start accumulating slaves, so that way they can engage, they can have the slaves engage in production, uh, and then you get the advent of like a laboring class, the slaves, and a non-laboring class, the slave owners, uh, and that's how we get to slave society, you know. And by this point, you know, um, society has evolved in such a fashion to really accommodate all of this new production that gets incorporated into the state. The state is used as a way to, you know, um, it direct uh, the energy of class society, you know, to, to maintain class society over a, a long period of time. Uh, the state is a fundamental facilitator of class society. Uh, so the state is used in order to, you know, maintain the relations, the existing relationships in any given class society. Uh, and that, you know, takes us into uh, feudal society uh, and into capitalist society. And I'm obviously brushing over for time because... No, we have time. We have time. We do? We have like, yeah, 11 minutes. That's time. We, okay, we have 11 <laughs> minutes left. That's not a lot of time. That's not a lot of time. No, but you should definitely give like a, uh, a summary of feudalism. To... to and if you want to read more about this, I would recommend Engels, you know, The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. And there are a couple of modern anthropologists that you can look towards that really vindicate a lot of Engels' positions. Uh, obviously, you know, Eng Engels was writing this in the 1870s, so there were a couple of things that, like, he did not have the information uh, necessary to add to this. But most of his positions were vindicated, and all of his ideological positions have been vindicated yeah. at this point. I would also recommend um, Fundamentals of Political Economy, the Shanghai textbook. The first two chapters do a really great exactly, jo good exactly. job of um, like showing you like what are the relations of production in, in uh, primitive communes, slave society, feudalism, and how does that lead us into capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. Because slave, side, slave society and feudalism are essentially the predecessors of capitalism. Exactly. So, you know, you, we, we, we see all these things progress, wealth gets accumulated into uh, fewer and fewer hands, you know, uh, this culminates in, you know, feudalism with the divine right of kings. You know, you have the king ruling over uh, his, you know, locality. Um, the king gives uh, land light rights to lords. The lords uh, have uh, control over a laboring class, you know, the peasantry. Uh, and the peasantry handles most of the production in feudalism. You know, that continues for a long time. Um, the wealth divide in feudalism gets greater and greater and greater, uh, and eventually, you know, you have this new middle class of merchants that starts to emerge from within feudalism uh, called the bourgeoisie. Um, the bourgeoisie... Whoa! <laughs> uh, uh, the bourgeoisie, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken on the etymology here, uh, origi originates with the French word bourgeois, uh, which is, you know, means middle class. Uh, and it serves as these, like, handicraftsmen, you the know. merchant class. The, these, yeah. these merchants uh, that would, you know, take their products, their commodities to market um, and, you know, sell these commodities on the market. This new merchant class comes about uh, noticing, you know, the, the wide wealth disparity, noticing all of the power that the, the king has. Um, and once again, being reductive, uh, takes action in, like, you know, the, the first bourgeois revolution, 
was uh, in, in France. Um, you know, uh, obviously, you know, there's the, the French reaction with Napoleon that comes after that. Um, and uh, like, long story short, transition from feudalism to capitalism. Um, <clears throat> so you have this entire new society of the bourgeoisie who is now in power. You know, you have the feudal, the feudal classes which are losing a lot of their power over time because you know, the, the bourgeoisie has supplanted uh, themselves as the dominant class in society. Um, they start you know, engaging in factory development, you know, um, really like collapsing production into these smaller and smaller factories. Uh, making them all happen in one place, uh, and then you have, you know, the proletariat, uh, the working class inside of capitalism, um, that comes about to uh, serve as, you know, the laboring class once again. And you can see this common element. There's always a laboring class and a class that appropriates the labor. Um, the reason why all of this is so important and the, how this connects to colonialism and uh, neo-colonialism. <coughs> which are two distinct things, Which are two way. distinct yeah. things, and I'll get to those concrete definitions yeah. in just a moment. Um, if I may just add, so I think what a lot of people, when, um, you know, when Macklemore talks about colonialism and when we see post of colonialism, and we see the examples being listed, it's important to note that they're actually, while they unknowingly, they're, they're talking about neo-colonialism because that is the, the type of colonial. Exactly. You know, neo, neo, I believe, is Greek for new. Or I don't know if it's Greek, but I know that the prefix neo, N-E-O, means new. Mm -hmm. So neo-colonialism, right? It's the new form of colonialism that ar arises, but please continue. Important. So really, really quick, uh, just like to get it out of the way. No, yeah. um, neo-colonialism is a type of... Um, economic imperialism that's uh, perpetrated by, you know, uh, the bourgeoisie. Uh, uh, just, and just to define, because I know some people may not know what imperialism is, it's, uh, it means the political and economic control of domination of one country by another country. Exactly, yeah. And that political and uh, economic control can come in many forms, from, you know, just general economic exploitation, which is the preferred method, to, you know, troops, boots on the ground, classical, like, you know, subjugation, um, where, you know, labor is performed uh, under threat of death. Um, so, neocolonialism happens when there are multiple imperialist interests uh, coalescing inside of a given nation. So, you know, the Philippines, for example. The, there is not just a single country that has imperialist interest in the Philippines. It's the imperialist powers as a whole, the general imperialist class that has an interest in the Philippines. And it's the same exact thing in Israel. Uh, uh, and this is like why it's such a huge issue here. And we need to properly understand, you know, yeah. what is imperialism? How does it function? Who uh, benefits from imperialism? Yeah. And one thing real quick I want to point out, we've been saying that there are two classes in society, and that is generally true. But particularly, there are substratas of those classes, like the petty bourgeoisie, the people who are... Small business owners. Small business owners, example. you know. Um, and in, uh, co uh, in nations that are colonies, or neo-colonies, um, you have the comprador class, the class that benefits from imperialist relationships inside of a given country. So, you know, it's not just like there's nobody there who benefits. There are people inside of these nations who are benefiting from this imperialist yeah. exploitation, you know? They're like, uh, the term is g given comprador puppets, right? Because they act as uh, representatives, liaisons, for the capitalist uh, within the imperialist powers. Exactly. Uh, Ethel and I also hold the line, because I know we're talking about imperialism, imperialist powers, who are they? Let's, let's identify them. So to give you a sort of structure, um, the two strongest imperialist powers are the United States and China. And it's worth noting that um, 
there is a sort of a, a two-line struggle, if you will, within uh, Marxist circles that uh, you know some Marxists claim China is is still so uh, excuse me China is still socialist uh, that capitalism was not restored in China, whereas um, other Marxists, uh, uh, Ethel and I are those other Mar among those other Marxists, claim that um, China was uh, excuse me capitalism was restored in China. The United States and China are the two strongest imperialist powers, and you know when we talk about World War III, it, it's going to be a, a war between these imperialist powers. Um, exactly, and, and they're not the only. I, I state them as the strongest, but there is, you know, Russia as an imperialist power, Germany, Japan, France, France Japan. Japan, Great Britain. So, the, but they're more like I would say they're like sub, it, like it, there's tiers. It, obviously, right? And even the imperialists uh, themselves know this because they have a ranking system for like any given nation's uh, military capacity. I believe uh, that Russia is currently, you know, the only other tier one. Uh, military power in the world besides the United States. Mm -hmm. And even then, like, you know, going band for band, if you will, uh, the United States, like, has more military power than Russia right now. Uh, China, I believe, is considered a, a tier two uh, military power. Um, but that does not mean that, like, oh, you know, the United States can just go ahead and dust these countries. It's, it's, it's not that simple. It's not even close to that simple. And that's why like, it's so important to properly dis discuss these things and to properly analyze like, how imperialism happens, um, which, uh, how do nations become imperialists, what form does imperialism take, and, and in any given society, you know? Because you know, there's an, a, a phenomenon called social, uh, uh, Social so chauvinism, you know, uh, socialist in name, capitalist in action. Um, and we cannot just take the word of like any given society. We, yeah. ha we have to really take a look at the concrete actions that the society is perpetrating uh, and, and really understand in a non-dogmatic fashion from all sides, you know, what how is, does this- uh, Ethel, how would you define dogmatic? Oh, just, um, looking at any particular thing from a single side or perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, if you are not being all side in your analysis, then your analysis is flawed, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's like, that is fundamental in science. That's why peer reviewing is a thing, you know? Yeah, no, and we do, we, we are reaching the end of our time here, but we do want to conclude, um, you know, the song Hins Hall by Macklemore was written in response to, you know, students, uh, particularly in Colombia, right? I would say Colombia kind of inspired the domino effect we mm -hmm. saw on mm -hmm. a, you know, uh, campuses nationwide. So yeah, the song was um, written in light of the encampments and you know the intense uh, state repression, right? Or police brutality we saw. Um, we do want to note that while like we commend the students that organize this because this takes a lot of time and resources. Exactly, and, yeah. And again, they're, you know, they're, their like their hearts and minds are in the, their hearts are in the right place. It's just a matter of clarity for for strategy. Mm -hmm. We do need to recognize the limitations, right? So when students organize and uh, to ask for um, their the university the the boards to divest from Israel, if if they were successful in these efforts, a few points there. One. It's only a matter of time before you know the university reestablishes ties with Israel, right? It could it would be very much a a performative, uh, temporary and performative because it's temporary, um, you know, a contract just to you know elite like alleviate the for the the encampments to uh, dissolve essentially, mm -hmm. and that does not again asking universities to divest would not uh, mean like Israel would cease to exist. Uh, we would still have class society, right? So we definitely think it's our responsibility to show not just students, right? Because college students is only one part of society. Um, how revolution is the answer here? If we want, you know, if, exactly. If we want the genocide in Palestine to stop, and obviously it's it's not if, just if Palestine. we want imperialism to stop, if we want the genocide yeah. in Palestine to stop, the genocide in Sudan yeah, to stop, the, geno the genocide in the Congo to stop then we need to take down imperialism. We need to figure out how to deal a death blow to the imperialist system, and that is the capitalist system. We need to have a proletarian revolution in this country if we, want any, if we have any hope at stopping this genocide. Yeah. 
And, and you know, Macklemore says, you know, the Nekba never ended. Yeah, it never ended. The only way it will end is if we have a proletarian revolution in this country. That's, that's the only way to solve this problem. Yeah. Absolutely. And we need, when we're talking about being strategic, we're talking about knowing who our friends and who our enemies are, we're asking the board of trustees at these like, uh, colleges um, you know, to, di to divest. When we're, we're asking our enemies to stop being our enemies. That's not how this works. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. We need to strike against our enemies. And we need to have our principal allies assist in striking against our enemies. This is supremely important. No. And I just wanted to harp on that for a bit. Yes. I think that's a beautiful way to end. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much to Miami Community Radio yes, for Yes, yes. Greatly appreciate the time. Yes. Thank, could not thank you guys enough, really. Uh, uh, yes. Happy to be here. Yeah, we are art for the people. And yeah, and we're excited to be mm -hmm. here over the summer. So yeah, thanks guys so Check much. Check us out on Instagram at artforthepeople.soflo. Uh, really hope you enjoyed the time and I hope we weren't too scattered here. So <laughs> uh, everyone have a great day. Uh, thank you for listening.